So next episode in biblical history is, in fact, this Israelite conquest. And let's just review. Most of us have some acquaintance with this story, if not from the Bible itself, at least from, say, Veggie Tales or something like that. Um, <laughs> I used to fall asleep to Veggie Tales. That was uh, one of the things I did when I was a young father. Little kids would pop up on my lap. We turn on Veggie Tales. The next thing I knew, they were singing the song at the end. That's how I got my naps when I was a young professor. Um, all right, the Israelite conquest. Before entering Canaan, God commanded the Israelites to drive the Canaanites out of the land and to settle it. With Joshua as their leader, succeeding Moses, the Israelites begin the conquest of Canaan by destroying and burning Jericho. That's the first city that they destroy, and that's on the west side of the Jordan River. The next city the Israelites destroy by fire is Ai, Ai, in the central hill country. And then the third and final city that the Israelites destroy under Joshua, again by fire, is Hatzor. We're going to see that these are very important cities for corroborating the biblical account because they are specifically mentioned as having been destroyed by fire. In an ancient time when, a, when one people conquered another and burned the city by fire, the fire would leave all the underlying uh, metal objects and various kinds of artifacts around remains of the material culture. And typically what would happen is that then people would just build right over the remains of the fire. So fire layers are incredibly significant for archaeologists because they allow you to go and locate events and then see what the remains were. From an archaeologist's point of view, there's nothing better than a good fire, a good fiery destruction. Okay, during the period of the judges, the Israelites slowly gained control over more of Canaan. And that's the picture we get from the biblical books of Joshua and Judges. Uh, here's a biblical passage that describes this uh, important event. When you cross over the River Jordan into the land of Canaan, then you shall drive out all the inhabitants of the land from before you and destroy all their figured stones. Part of the reason that God condemns the Canaanites to this destruction is their idolatry, their child sacrifice, many of these practices that he finds detestable. And then he goes on to say, and you must destroy their molten images and demolish all their high places, also places of idolatry, and you shall take possession of the land and live in it, for I have given it to you for you to possess. Okay? And here's a geographic orientation here on the map. We mentioned that there are these three key cities. We've got Jericho, which is the first one that the Israelites conquer. Secondly is the city Ai, a, spelled A-I again. And then finally, it's Hatzor, way in the north. Now, there's other conquests in between, but these are the three big ones from an archaeological point of view, again, because the Bible specifically mentions fiery destruction. And that's something that's easily testable from an archaeological point of view. If you can find those layers and date them, you can determine whether or not the biblical record is correct about these claims. And here, the, the, the claim with Hatzor, it's very dramatic. Then Joshua turned back at that time and captured Hatzor and struck its king with a sword, for Hatzor formerly was the head of all these kingdoms, all these idolatrous pagan kingdoms. And they struck every person who was in it with the edge of the sword, utterly destroying them, and there was no one left who breathed, and he burned, that is, Joshua burned Hatzor with fire. So a grisly account, but very specific and very testable from an archaeological point of view if these cities can be located and excavated. All right, now there's three views on the Israelite conquest. There is the biblical view, taking the biblical chronology at face value, but we also realized there were skeptics. So there's also the earlier consensus view was that there was a conquest, but it began much later in the 13th century BC. But now there's also the view of the minimalists, the biblical minimalists, who not only deny that there was an exodus, they also deny that there was a conquest, and they claim that any destruction evidence you find in these sites is from a series of indigenous peasant rebellions or warfare between in the 13th and 12th centuries BC. Okay, so it has nothing to do with Joshua. If there is such evidence, and in any case, there is no evidence of the actual conquest as recorded in the biblical books of Joshua and Judges. Now, the earlier consensus was that there was a conquest, but it happened later. And this was based on the work of William Albright and another archeologist named Starkey. They discovered a 13th century BC destruction layer at Betin, or what they assumed was the ancient city of Bethel, and also at Lachish. They attributed both of these destruction layers to Joshua. Then later, there were other archaeologists who came along, and they excavated other sites, and they found evidence of 13th century destructions, and they said, this must be the conquest, even though most of the cities that were excavated were not actually mentioned as having been destroyed in the Joshua and Judges accounts. 
So this kind of consensus formed on really a very flimsy basis. It didn't really correlate to the biblical view. It was originally formed in order to support the biblical view, but then as more and more scholars you know, pieced together the evidence and got in the act, it really ended up underwriting a kind of skepticism about the, the account overall. And the key contributor there was Kathleen Kenyon. She was a British archeologist. She excavated Jericho in the 1950s, and she found that there was substantial evidence of destruction at Jericho, but she dated it to about 1550 BC. Clearly, that's much earlier than the biblical date. And so what you have then is kind of a hodgepodge of evidence. People who think that there was a conquest, but it happened much later. But then when Kenyon's work came along, it said, look, there's no evidence of Jericho being part of that conquest. And so as a result, people began to be increasingly skeptical about the account as a whole. And later then we, we had the biblical minimalists who came along and said, look, it didn't happen at all. Okay. So again, our three key cities are Jericho, Ai, and Hatsor. And they're key, again, because they afford the unique opportunity to test the biblical claims against the archaeological record. Now, the first place we're going to look at is Jericho. We're fortunate to start with Jericho because there's really not much doubt about the site for Jericho. And there have been three excavations and some subsequent analysis, very important analysis of the earlier excavations that gives us a real clear picture of the evidence. And the first excavation was performed by some Austrians and Germans back in the early part of the 20th century. Then there was a British archaeologist, John Garstang, who provided perhaps the, the most definitive early excavation of the site from 1930 to 1936. You can see he was there a long time. And then Kathleen Kenyon came in 1950 and stayed for eight years and did further work. Now, interestingly, in all these excavations, there was a common thread. And that thread is that there was plenty of evidence of destruction of Jericho. There was lots of destruction evidence. And much of it, interestingly, especially highlighted by Garstang, matched the biblical record. First of all, there were walls, big walls, around Jericho. And they were impressively fortified. The outer stone retaining wall, or what some of the archaeologists called a revetment wall, held a steep plastered glacis. On top of this retaining wall, there was an upper red brick mud wall. It was estimated to be about four and a half feet thick and about 12 feet tall. And we've got a picture of that back here on the board. We've got um, the retaining wall, a revetment wall, and then on top of it, there's a red brick structure. Okay? And in the archaeological uh, excavation of Jericho, there was evidence that this wall had fallen. And I'm going to now show you a kind of cross section and it's going to be on the screen over here, actually. Okay? So you had this red, this red brick wall on top of the retaining wall. And then at some point, it was destroyed. And the wall, oddly, fell outward. It fell outward and then left the remains of all those red bricks were, that were on the top of the wall right in front of the wall, making a kind of ramp that would allow invaders access into the city. Now, one other fact that all the excavations showed was that immediately inside the walls, there were houses of mud brick, and they were built right into the walls, which, again, was a little bit uncanny when you remember, remember the story of Rahab, the prostitute, and how the, the spies came and they were let down uh, over the wall. But you, you read the account. There were walls, there were houses built right into the city walls on the inside. And you could read about those in the Joshua account. So lots of things that are kind of suggestive that the biblical account may be correct. But again, that key problem was the problem of dating. Okay? And Kathleen Kenyon insisted that there the date was wrong. There were some other facts at Jericho too, though, that again created some interesting reasons to suspect maybe the Bible was onto something. Jericho did not fall by the typical siege. As I mentioned, the walls fell outward. Okay? When invaders would lay siege to a city, they would bash the walls and bash them down. Usually they'd go in, or else they'd climb over, find some way in through other means. So the, the walls falling outward is a very unusual result of a siege. The other thing was that the siege seemed to be short because the city's grain stores weren't plundered, and many of the jars of the grain were left intact. This is also unusual. When invaders invade a city, what do they do? They get the goodies, right? They, they take spoil, right? So no evidence that spoil was taken. So for some, it was indicative of the biblical description. 
because you may remember that Joshua was commanded not to take spoil. So the big problem, again, Kathleen Kenyon, she dates it, though, definitively to 1550 BC. Now, how does she get this date? Why did this form such an important part of the scholarly consensus? Well, how do scholars date things, or archaeologists date things like this? They've got a number of methods. One of them, though, is pottery. Uh, just as we were mentioning before how names can change over periods of time, well, styles of pottery can change over time. Styles of writing can change over time. So one way of dating an area is to look for distinctive styles of pottery that were known to characterize a particular era, especially if you can find one that is known to characterize a particular era and no other era. Well, from this period of time, there was a style of pottery, from, actually from the, the period of time about 1400, when, according to the Bible, the conquest took place, there was a style of pottery that was quite common called Cypriot pottery. It was a Cypriot imported pottery. And especially among wealthier people, they tended to buy this pottery, import it, and use it. Well, Kenyon searched for this kind of pottery and found no evidence of it. And so she assumed this couldn't be a 1400 destruction because there's no pottery from that period of time. And so she attributed the destruction either to the Egyptians or to another people called the Hyksos. But then a new development took place. This was about 1990, more than 30 years after she finished her excavation. Uh, an archaeologist named Bryant Wood, whom you saw in a video clip in the last lecture on the Exodus, um, went and examined all the records of the previous excavations. He got to go in and look at the pottery that had been collected. And he discovered, first of all, that whereas Kathleen Kenyon said there was no imported Cypriot pottery, that Garstang, the earlier archaeologist, had found a whole load of it. And he said, wait a minute, there's something wrong here. It turned out the problem in Kenyon's excavation was that she was excavating only a poor quarter of the city. But the Cypriot pottery, remember what I said about it? Wealthy people. Wealthy, wealthy people, people used it. And, and Garstang, who excavated the wealthy quarters of the city as well, found a lot of this Cypriot pottery. So that was actually a positive piece of evidence that all this destruction evidence that was so suggestive of the accuracy of the biblical account could now be kind of recalibrated in, in terms of time. It suggests now that all that evidence is the result of a 1400 BC destruction, not a 1550 destruction. Okay. Now, one other piece of evidence that I think is really cool, partly because we've got some show and tell to go with it, um, is that Kenyon overlooked something else, something very important. She overlooked Egyptian scarab seals that had been found in Jericho burial grounds. And they were seals that mentioned three Egyptian leaders. Hatshepsut, that uh, Egyptian pharaohess that we discussed earlier, Tutmosis III, and Amenhotep III. And I'm going to turn the board over here so we can understand why this evidence is so significant. And we're also going to get a, a sample of an Egyptian scarab. Now, these are really cool because they are preserved nicely, all right? They're called dung beetle scarabs. For some reason, the Egyptians uh, really thought dung beetles were cool. Um, these are beetles that crawl around on, you know, dung, all right? So I don't know why you'd worship something like that, but, you know, whatever floats your boat, I guess. Um, not that we're defending relativism or anything, okay? All right. And then on the other side would be an inscription, right? And the inscription could be a minor official, or it might mention, you know, a pharaoh. It might be a minor official who's serving a pharaoh. In any case, in the Jericho burial grounds, you have inscriptions that are mentioning pharaohs that were not even alive yet in 1550 BC. What's that show about when the destruction happened? It was not later. It's got to be after that, doesn't it? Okay. So another piece of evidence that shifts the, the dating. Now, the three pharaohs I mentioned were alive in this, this period of time from roughly the, the, roughly the 15th century BC to the beginning of the 14th century BC. So when you take that evidence collectively, it suggests, again, a later date for the conquest, and one now that suggests all that key evidence is actually supportive of the biblical record. The Bible says five or six key things that you can also corroborate by examining this extra biblical archaeological evidence. Here's some points of agreement. The Joshua account and the archaeological excavation of Jericho agree on the following points. Jericho was a strong, fortified city with walls and a gate. 
You can read about that in the verses that I put on the slide, Joshua 2, 7 and 6, 5. The attack occurred after the spring harvest. As evidence of that, there were full grain stores found in excavation, indicating destruction soon after the harvest. Joshua 3 and chapter 5, verse 10, mention that the attack was after the spring harvest. The walls collapsed outward. I'm going to go back to that earlier picture because I want you to see this. Because it brings, sometimes when you have an archaeological investigation, it actually illuminates a part of the biblical text that maybe didn't even seem that significant to you. If you go to Joshua 6, chapter 5, the Lord's speaking to Joshua, and he says, when you hear the trumpet sound long blasts, have all the people give a loud shout. We all know this story, right? Then the wall of the city will collapse, and the people will go up, every man straight in. Okay? Now, can you see how this archaeological evidence illuminates that passage? It says that the people, once the walls collapse, the people can go up and straight in. Well, if the walls fell outward and formed this rubble, it formed a kind of natural ramp that allowed Joshua's soldiers to go right in over the top of the walls. And it's, so it's, it's quite an extraordinary kind of insight into what actually happened that, that comes from the excavation. Back to our points of convergence here. We've got walls collapse outward, allowing soldiers access to the city, but the city was not looted. Numerous grain jars were found full, intact, no looting, but the Israelites were specifically forbidden to plunder Jericho. You can read about that in Joshua chapter 6, verse 17. The city was destroyed by fire. Excavations reveal a conclusive fire destruction layer. Okay? The book of Joshua says so, chapter 6, verse 24, and the archaeological record concurs. And the conquest of Jericho dates to roughly 1406, 1400 BC, in accord with the biblical chronology. And the evidence confirms those dates. Now, when you, you, when you compile all that, it's a pretty impressive list, isn't it? And that's, again, what I mean by the specificity of corroboration. When the Bible makes very specific claims, it invites very specific testing. And the excavation is one of the ways that you can test these claims. And it is, I think, so interesting, despite the you know, kind of wrong turns and scholarly opinion, that there's now an increasing body of evidence that not only says that, yes, Jericho was destroyed in a manner that matches the biblical account, but it was destroyed at the right time as well.